Hello and welcome everyone uh, to this latest weekly market recap uh, for the week ending Friday, October 4th. This is Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and it's a pleasure to be with you again this weekend. Uh, we had a big, big jobs report out on Friday. Numbers came in much better than expected, and not only were the numbers better than expected, but we also raised the jobs number from the August report. So uh, kind of a double win for the bulls. We saw a big gap up. Uh, we did see some selling early in the day, giving back most of those gains, but then we rallied again this afternoon with the Dow Jones Industrial Average finishing at an all-time high close, the S&P 500 getting close to another all-time high close, and we saw some uh, uh, strength into the close as well for the small caps and for that NASDAQ 100, though both of those indices do remain somewhat off of those earlier highs. I uh, wanted to go in and talk about a few things uh, today, a couple of things I thought that were important in terms of price action this last week. So uh, let's jump in. The uh, first thing I want to do is just kind of go through, I like to start off with this uh, chart list of the six major indices, of course, the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ 100, uh, the small cap Russell 2000, the uh, S&P 400 mid cap, and also the transportation index, and then our 11 major sectors as well. And by summarizing, we can quickly gain a visual as to what really worked last week and what didn't. Clearly, energy was our leader. So we had the uh, Middle East conflict between Iran and uh, Israel kick back up again, um, some fighting back and forth. Uh, and as a result, we saw crude oil spike significantly. I think crude oil, I'll look at that chart here in just a few minutes, but crude oil, I believe, was up about 8% last week, maybe a little bit more. And as a result, the XLE was up almost 7% this week, easily surpassing all the other areas of the market. So energy was clearly a big winner this week. If uh, Well, then financials and utilities. Uh, financials being a little bit more aggressive, utilities more defensive, but they're both both somewhat um, uh, value-oriented. So I think that was a little bit of the key this week as well. We seem to um, gravitate a little bit more towards value. If you go down toward the bottom of this list, you'll see the areas of the market that did not perform well. The Dow Jones transportation average, once again, failed to break out, pulled back again to a recent low. We'll take a look at that chart in just a few minutes. I also noticed that both of the consumer areas, both discretionary and staples were down in the bottom five, both losing more than 1% last week. And then also down there were both uh, real estate and the materials group. Materials struggling a little bit with uh, a rebound in the dollar. I thought that was one of the stories from last week that we'll take a little bit, um, you know, we'll take a little bit more of an in-depth look at in just a little bit. Um, but from there, I wanna go take a look at some of the major indices. So first I wanna start off with the Dow Jones. Dow Jones made the breakout closing on its high on Friday. And I believe the prior high, actually, rather than guess, let me just say where that prior high close was. Um, it was right at about the 42.330 area, I believe. Uh, well, there's 42.313 on the close. There's 42.330. So the 42.330 was the close on September 30th. We opened up October with a little bit of weakness, and then we rallied back and on Friday closed at 42.352. So it was just a slight beat, but it was the highest close all time and wanted certainly to mention that. The S&P 500 managed to come up just a little bit short of that all-time high, but still finishing strongly today as well. You can see the gap up um, on the S&P 500, and that occurred, of course, with the jobs report out um, this morning. There was one negative in the jobs report, and that was average hourly earnings, which jumped up a little bit more than expected, four-tenths of 1% versus three-tenths of 1%. And um, uh, the August number, average hourly earnings also uh, was revised higher from four tenths of one percent to five tenths of one percent. So average hourly earnings going up. At least got to be thinking about well, what about wage inflation? 
Uh, I think it's way too early. I mean, the, the Fed's already come out and said, hey, we think inflation is in check. Um, be interesting to see, though, with a couple of inflation reports coming up next week. We got uh, the um, September CPI report out on Thursday and the September PPI report out on Friday. So those are going to be a couple of big reports in the week ahead. But if all of a sudden those show a little bit more movement uh, to the upside on the heels of what we saw in today's jobs report, um, that would be an interesting combination to see maybe what the Fed might have to say um, leading up to its next Fed meeting in November. Anyway, S&P 500 didn't make the breakout, but it did get close. All right, let's take a look at energy because energy was um, uh, one of the areas of the market that did very, very well this past week. You can see the huge move over the last seven trading days, um, then just a, a massive rally to the upside, much of it as a result of the increasing tensions in the Middle East, the fact that uh, the price of crude oil jumped as much as it did. Um, so if you're in energy, uh, in a lot of the energy stocks, or maybe even in the XLE, the ETF that tracks the group, um, you can see it was a very good, solid uh, past seven or eight trading days, especially this past week. But we are right up against a key resistance level. So I wanted to just to annotate this for you for a second. But if you look back, and this is going back now for the past five months or so, maybe a little more than five months, but we had a high on the XLE coming in in mid-May, uh, right around 93 and a half. You can see we tested that level again in mid-July, again at the end of July, and now here we are again. So this is the fourth time that we've gone up to about this 93 and a half level. Friday's high was at 93.46. Can we break through? I don't know. I will say that the PPO looks as strong as it has at any point over the last five months or so. So if we do make the breakout, I think that this bullish momentum could accelerate to the upside. So watch 93.50 on the XLE next week. Let me show you crude oil because here was crude oil. We had dropped, uh, if you remember, not that long ago, just a few weeks ago, I was talking about crude oil being down uh, at the lowest level we'd seen in 2024. And if we stretch this chart out, <clears throat> go back five years, you can see this move down to mid-60s, early 2023, got down to the mid-60s here uh, in uh, November 2021, again, August 2021, in the low to mid-60s. So we had gotten down on the crude oil to a level, a key level of support that it held for about the last three years, maybe three and a half years. So that was an important level to the downside we held. Now we're moving back up, trying to get back through this weekly 20 uh, week EMA, which is at 74.76, and we closed at 74.38. We've been trading down below that 20-week moving average for the past two to three months, so it'll be interesting to see if we can move back through it or if we simply just test it and begin to roll back over again. That'll be a story for next week and maybe for the balance of October as well. Financials. I want to talk about financials because financials love the fourth quarter of the year. Um, this is the best relative performing sector in the fourth quarter among all 11 sectors going back to 2013 since this secular bull market began. So financials don't typically lead a secular bull market. They normally just go for the ride. But in the fourth quarter, we have a completely different ball game. The XLF, um, since 2013, I got a couple of numbers here for you. Uh, since 2013, the XLF has gained an average of 9.2% during the months of October, November, and December. 9.2%. That's a solid year on the S&P 500. And that's what the XLF has done just during the fourth quarter over the last dozen years or so. The other nine months, the XLF averages gaining 5.2%. So in nine months, it averages 5.2%, but just the last three months of the year, we get another 9.2%. I also want to mention that at Friday's close, the XLF did break out to another all-time high. So it's got great technicals. The AD line looks strong. 
The PPO is still well above the zero line. So we've got bullish momentum and we're now into a seasonal period that financials like a lot as well. So on the seasonality chart, this is where I came up with the numbers that I was just talking about. You can see over the last 12 years, going back to 2013, this is how the uh, XLF has traded. Um, these last three months of the year tends to go up pretty often. 90% of November's, we see the XLF rise. And in October and December, usually about three quarters of, of those months, October and December, we see the XLF move higher. When you look at that and compare it to everything else throughout the year, I mean, these three months really stand out for financials. So I think you need to know that um, and maybe adjust portfolios accordingly. But fourth quarter tends to be a very strong one for the financial group. So here's transportation group. Now, this is a group that literally is on the opposite side of the spectrum. Um, did not perform well last week. You can see all of these failed tops or failed breakout attempts at about 16.2 up to maybe 16.4. And it looks really ominous because when you just have, I mean, I don't know how many attempts we've had here, but probably at least, at least seven, eight, I don't know, something like that, um, attempts to get through this 16.2 to 16.4 area. It would be very meaningful if we actually do get through it. But after eight failures, it starts to get a little old and you really want to see it rather than try to anticipate it. <clears throat> I will say that transportation stocks do like the fourth quarter as well, especially November. So we are coming up on a really strong period of the year for the transports. Maybe that'll do it. Maybe that'll be what we need to get through. But until we get through, I think we have to be a little careful with the transports. All right, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the last thing I wanna talk about, I'm kind of losing a little bit of my voice, so probably good that we're getting close to the end here. One more drink of water, maybe that'll do the trick. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the US 10-year treasury yield versus Germany's 10-year uh, treasury yield, and I'll stretch this out. Um, what's interesting is that the, and all this is, is taking the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield and subtracting the German 10-year Treasury yield. And what we have found is that this has been going down for probably the last six months or so. But notice what's happened over the last three or four weeks. We're actually starting to move back up again. So it looks like this channel has been broken. We're now getting a golden cross, meaning that the 10-year treasury yield here in the U.S. is starting to move up faster to the upside than the, the uh, German 10-year treasury yield. And normally what that results in is a strengthening dollar. I mean, when you see this relationship going down, it normally coincides with a falling dollar. So I want you just to look at this chart. You can see U.S. 10-year treasury yield minus the German 10-year Treasury yield has been declining since April. Now look at the dollar chart. This was April on the dollar. Double top, what's it been doing? It's been declining. Well, here over the last three weeks or so, we've seen the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield start to pull away from the German 10-year Treasury yield. And what's happened? Over almost the exact same period, the dollar's rising. So, that's a key relationship, one that you need to be aware of whenever you look at the dollar, whenever you look at gold, um, because it does give us some really good clues, this relationship between the U.S. and, and uh, Germany. So let's take a look at the dollar on another chart. Here is a monthly chart that goes back the last 15 years. And notice the dollar kept struggling for many years around the 100 to 102 level. You can see all these tops, multiple tops, over many years, seven or eight years, could not get through. Finally, during the, um, uh, the cyclical bear market in 2022, we saw the dollar break out. So while everybody was moving their money out of U.S. stocks, they were putting it in the U.S. dollar. And so the dollar broke out. And notice when we pulled back here, where are we holding a support? 
that prior resistance zone has now become support zone for the dollar down to 100. And we're starting to turn back up again. As I just showed right here, big move to the upside, big move up here in terms of the US 10 year treasury yield versus Germany's 10 year treasury yield. And so the long term chart here tells us that we probably should be looking for bottom and return back to the upside. And that's the same thing that the short term charts are telling us. So let me show you one other thing on the dollar here, which I find very interesting. Here is the US dollar, and we're going back to 2009. And I'm showing you how the dollar long term has been trending higher. I know a lot of folks only look at the, you know, they look in the rearview mirror and they can only see the most recent past. Um, and so you run into issues because you can't get past the recent, um, you know, it's called recency bias. So everybody looks at the most recent data the last year or two and sees the dollars going down and thinks, oh, we're in a period of weak, of a weak dollar. I don't believe that's the case. I think we continue to be in a long-term uptrend. And when we reach toward the upper end of this channel, we tend, if you go back and look at history, we tend to move our way back down toward the bottom of the channel. Well, we had a lot of support right here, just below, right at 100, maybe just below 100. And the trend line, we're still well above that trend line, but closer to it. And so this could be an area where we do start to make a more longer term type of move to the upside in the dollar. Now, as we were falling in the dollar since April, notice what was moving up, gold. And a lot of folks really getting bullish on gold, which personally I think is a huge mistake. Um, I like gold in the near term. As long as it's trending higher, I'm a fan. But long term, I don't see the bullishness in gold. So let me just talk about that for a couple minutes here. If you notice here over the long term, whichever direction the dollar goes, for the most part, and it's not exact, but for the most part, gold tends to go lower when the dollar is going up. And that's reflected down here in this bottom panel. This is a correlation coefficient of the US dollar versus gold. And I highlighted in blue these periods when the positive correlation is greater than 0.5 up to 1.0. If you get to 1.0, it means that whatever two securities or indices or whatever asset classes you're looking at, when you're at plus one, it means they go together hand in hand, either to the upside or the downside, but they're going hand in hand. When you're at the bottom at minus one, it means they're going in opposite directions. So whatever you're looking at, one's going in one direction, the other's going in the other, and that is why you get these minus one, one readings. Now notice how often gold and the dollar are in positive correlation, you know, above 0 0.5, and look how often they're in this red shaded area, which is between minus 0 0.5 and minus one, which reflects inverse correlation. I think if you just look at this visually, it's pretty easy to see that the dollar and gold tend to go opposite one another. Now, the correlation uses 20 periods. That's the default. So you might look at this and say, well, that makes no sense because the dollar's going up and the US, or the dollar's going up and gold's going up. So why is there so much time spent in inverse correlation. Well, it's because the periods are simply for 20 periods. So it's not looking at this, it's not going back and looking from here to here and here to here. Otherwise, it would be pretty positive correlation. But in this case, it's negative because if you just look at 20, um, what is this daily chart? 20 day periods, which is very short term, they do tend to go opposite more often than they go together. <clears throat> A little bit more water, almost done. One more chart I wanna show you. And this is gold versus the S&P 500. And I keep repeating this. I know folks are still out there saying, well, you've been way off on gold. Well, if you wanna call me way off on gold, feel free. Uh, I think I've been pretty spot on. Gold came down during the 1980 and 1980s and 1990s 
bull market. When did gold outperform the S&P 500? Remember, this chart is a relative chart. It's only showing us whether or not gold is outperforming the S&P 500. When it's going down, it's not. When it's going up, it is. When did it go up? When did it outperform the S&P 500? It outperformed the S&P 500 from 2000 to roughly probably 2008, 2009. Why? What happened from 2008 to 2009? Or from 2000 to 2009? It was a secular bear market. That was when the bottom went in March of 2009. So one of the things that gold, one, one time when gold is going to show relative strength is when stocks are simply weak because gold is known as a hedge. So when the market gets weak, people flock to gold. Makes perfect sense. Since 2009, and especially since 2013, which is when we started, resumed a, a new secular bull market, since then, what has gold done relative to the S&P 500? I mean, I look at this chart and I still see a downtrend. I know there are some, especially some gold bulls, that look at this and look at the last six months and they say, oh, gold is excellent, it's breaking out all time high. But has it really done that much relative to the S&P? S&P has been going up too. I mean, I would say gold probably has outperformed the S&P by maybe a couple percentage points this year. But that pales in comparison to how much you would have lost investing in gold over the last 10, 12 years, maybe even up to 14, 15 years. So that's my whole point here is that I believe the U.S. or I, excuse me, I believe U.S. stocks are going to continue up in its current secular bull market. And so I believe the relationship of gold to the S&P 500, this ratio, is going to continue down just like it did in the 1980s and 1990s. We'll see who's right in the end. But I don't care about three or six months strength. Look at the, I mean, even throughout this downtrend, we've had periods where gold outperforms. Normally, it's when the market is weak. So in 2000, that's what we have right here. That was the pandemic. 2002, or excuse me, 2022, that was cyclical bear market. 2018, fourth quarter of 2018, there's a trade war, another cyclical bear market. That's when you're getting most of these pops in gold relative to the S&P 500. We're not seeing that right now. In fact, even though we've had strength in 2024, we haven't even reached the highs that we saw on a relative basis in 2022 and 2023. So I'm not buying into all the hype on gold. I still believe the S&P 500 will be a much better investment over the next several years. Um, if I'm wrong, come back and talk to me in five years. Um, but watch that relative support line because if that goes again, gold's the last place you want to be. Anyway, that is it for me. I do uh, hope everyone will like the video. If you do like uh, our approach to the market, subscribe to our channel. That'll really help us in our algorithms as we try to continue to build our YouTube community. Anyway, have a great rest of your weekend, everybody. Enjoy next week, and I'll be back next week for your next weekly market recap. Have a great weekend. Happy trading.